on <laughs> to um, uh, again, uh, you know, I, I think everything that you refer to comes back to inclusion, in particular, um, you, uh, a really keen interest that you, you declared earlier around gender equity. Um, and, uh, and I've also really, <laughs> I, I've got a big note here that I circled, that the, in, you highlighted the impact of training uh, which is a bit scary for anyone in teacher education, and that you had some critical incidences and experiences that really made you reevaluate your training. And I take it at Brighton, did, uh, certainly my training was gendered, that men did certain activities, the women did other activities. I happened yeah. to dislocate my shoulder as a student, and that meant I couldn't go and do the rugby with the men. So I was looking back, I was really fortunate because I spent. Um, uh, 12 weeks in a, additional dance with with the women and uh, oh. it, it helped me enormously in my in my career um but I, I mean looking back what bizarre what a bizarre way of structuring uh, a degree program that men and women <laughs> should be different activities i mean it, yeah it, it, is, it really is ridiculous to be honest but anyway enough from me over to you um, <laughs> is there is there a link in your opinion between the foundation experiences that boys and girls get in early years and how that plays out in gender inclusion. Do you look at gender inclusion and FMS through a similar lens? Um, yes, I think so. I mean, the, the teachers that I work with and even the lecturers that I work with in my consultancy role in FMS um, and quite a few sport coaches as well, they had a, a whole, you know, we all have them, but they, they brought with them a whole, a whole set of biases and prejudices. And, and a, yes, some of those were based around um, gender. And um, in, I remember that one of the first tasks that I would do with them was to give them a sort of multiple choice test where, where it assessed where they were with, with the learning of FMS. And I, I, we had a question in there um, that was uh, about the overarm throw or overhand throw, whatever you want to call it, it has two names. Um, and um, it said, you know, at the age of um, seven years old, um, it's our girls going to be um, more adept at um, throwing the um, tennis ball in an overhand throw or will boys be and, and does gender affect um, this skill? And so, you know, we used to sort of tease out all the different answers from that. And um, the amount of, I would say 95% of people who wrote an answer to that and then explained it afterwards in groups, they would always talk about how um, uh, girls were worse at, at throwing than boys and that this was natural. Now, as soon as you bring in the word natural to any context, as a sociologist, it's a disaster. Um, but it's certainly a disaster if you bring in Na it's natural for girls to be worse at overhand throw than boys at the age of seven. And so that would open up the whole can of worms about gender um, and also about how we as teachers can reinforce those uh, gendered practices and um, the construction of children as having certain fundamental movement skills outcomes because they were a girl, because they were a boy. Um, and so that, you know, that was always a very interesting um, discussion around it. And then we would, we, we would talk about um, how the lessons would, would play out if they had those views, how the assessment um, processes would play out if they had that view and so on. So going in with that very, very biased gendered lens of what you expect to come out of a particular skill-based practice on the overhand throw, 
can of course influence and be a huge variable because you're giving different feedback to um, girls than you would to boys. Um, perhaps you're giving more support to the boys because you know they're going to be better um, and therefore you have that kind of self-fulfilling prophecy um, taking place and so on. So that that's the kind of discussions that we had. And I think some of them, you know, they say when you look in the mirror, sometimes you go, whoa. <laughs> and I think for some it was it was a looking in the mirror moment. And they were just like, my goodness, I never even realized I had that, you know, going on. And so um, yeah, it's it's an inevitable part. And then we'd go on and we'd talk about the the notion of of you know nature versus nurture and we talk about the sociocultural norms for girls in play-based contexts and you know I mean for me for example I had three brothers and so I was brought up to be just one of the crowd you know just joining in with everything physical climbing trees and jumping on bikes and mending bikes and you know that was part of my socialization process how that affected my sport um sporty uh nature was inevitable because i i i grew up with a load of boys you know um whereas uh you know when you apply it to other contexts like my two daughters um you know two girls no boys influence whatsoever and they didn't grow up so they ended up becoming far more interested in individual sports like cycling and running and dancing and and of course dancing um and so on yeah yeah fascinating and uh really interesting how you draw on your and apply your learning to so many different contexts and um yeah we you can't escape learning from our own experiences as parents um Perhaps a little bit, I always think that's a little bit problematic. I, you know, if I look at myself, I, I've probably become a much better educator generally since becoming a parent 20 yes. years ago. Um, mm. But then, of course, you know, there's many people who are fantastic educators who are not parents. So I'm not saying that there's a, there's a correlation there or causation. No. It's just, you know, it's just our <laughs> route or my route and... Uh, uh, you know those sparks that triggered thinking in in me and and um so just as we come to the end of this conversation there's two themes that i'm really interested to hear hear your views on um and they're i guess they're a bit heavier um and uh you know i'm always really wary as uh, someone who's you know recently left uh, working at a university and there's mm. so many conversations about the relevance and you know mm. research how does it impact on practice mm -hmm. and you know like yourself my my biases uh, academic biases and interests lean towards critical social science um mm. and you know regularly challenged you know why is that relevant and you know what does someone like Foucault bring to me when I've got to teach you <laughs> year nine on a rainy Wednesday afternoon or whatever it is. <laughs> so two things that you can relate or you can separate or you can only talk about one. You've written a lot uh, and spoken a lot and you are present on social media really questioning what some call the healthification of PE or movement and that the body should be used or moved primarily to bring about better health, uh, which presumably impacts on big national issues like um, strain on the health service, quote unquote, stuff mm. like that. And, and you mentioned earlier that your PhD was drawing on the work of uh, Michel Foucault. So um, why is Foucault relevant in PE and or how do you see this healthification and why do you think that that's a problem for you? Mm. Um, well, I think prior to my PhD, I only looked at Foucault, I did a master's in arts, a master of arts in dance, and we looked at, at Foucault and how, how it played out in terms of the gendered body in our ballet and, and so on. And so Foucault was always kind of bubbling away under the surface, and that was 10 years after I'd done my undergraduate 
And so I always had a, a knowledge of an interest in that uh, because I could see how it could, could be linked to PE, but not many people use Foucault. Foucault is very, very complex and you've got to have a really good supervisor and a lot of time and energy to engage with Foucault's works and then try to apply it to the body um, in physical education. But, you know, I'm relentless on that level. If I feel as though it's got some relevance, I won't give up. And so um, I was very lucky. I, I actually didn't have PE supervisors for my PhD. I had two sociologists and they were both very familiar with Foucault. And one of them was an expert on genealogy and uh, genealogy in a nutshell, if you can ever break it down, is basically, you know, um, the the idea of of power being constructing the body. Um, well, anything. But in this case, it was it was the body um, and how that filters through and affects the way that the body is um, uh, regulated. In, in whatever way. And so I was kind of fascinated by that and very interested in, um, in some of the old syllabuses that I'd found in England. Um, and I'd looked at these for quite some time and I thought that would make an interesting PhD. I'd been quite fascinated because my mum was teaching in the 1950s and she remembers those two syllabuses that came out then and they were called you know moving and growing and they were all very sort of um female dominated phys educationalists um had actually um been paramount in the dr the drive and the construction of those syllabuses and that was my mum's era and so i i grew up sort of a decade two decades later in that era that it was still trickling through um, primary physical education, you know, being about movement and Rudolf Laban and the body being centralized and, and all of that. So that kind of child at the center of learning. So I know that that's had a huge influence. But these old syllabuses were very much um, health based. Um, PE was PT, yeah, physical training. Um, there were these pictures, you know, with these regimented um, sort of movements and, and all, all the joints, you know, the, the minutiae of, of all of those joints being in a certain place at a certain time and the beats and the rhythms and it was prescribed and functional and it was all to get better posture. Um, to improve the breathing in a person well, despite the fact that they all lived in slums. Um, these poor little working class kids, you know, were, were literally dragged through this military training to try and improve their health. Meanwhile, you know, they, they went back home to dire circumstances. But hey, physical training can improve anything, can't it? So um, with that in mind, when it came to the, the next set of syllabuses that I was looking at, which was... Um, there weren't actually many across a hundred years, believe it or not. You know, you'd think there would be 50, 60, but there was only about 10 or 12 syllabuses. Not a lot, really. But the next set of um, syllabus be looked at the body, but in a different way. And it became very much health governed. And I began to see these, these discourses of healthism coming in. And I and I thought, ah, yeah, yeah, that's what was going on. When I was training in the 80s, there was this big push, wasn't there, for health and fitness. And, and then what came out of that was the national curriculum. And the national curriculum became very activity driven with dance and gym and games in primary. And then you had swimming and outdoor adventurous activities. Um, in, uh, in the la la latter years of primary. So I could see this shift where it had gone from this very regimented um, health, physical training, posture, et cetera, to this flourishing child um, of the 50s um, that was Laban based. And then it moved into this, again, this quite prescribed healthism, and, and almost using PE as, a, well, it was 
in my conclusion, I, I tore it to shreds. Um, it was using PE as a medium through which certain power driven messages from ruling authorities were embedded. And, and I looked at you know, hundreds of policies around obesity um, and around the whole, this whole notion of um, sport as well and competitive sport. And I began to see these, you know, these patterns of discourses and um, and that's you know that's how we have ended up where we are now. So my research looked at 114 years, and and mapped it across time. But it didn't do it in this linear way. What it did was it started with the present, which is what Foucault calls um, history of the present, and that's what um, genealogy is. So it started with the present and it said, you know, what issues have we got? What challenges? What, what really stands out as going on in PE now? And then I went in reverse. So I had four chapters and they went from contemporary right the way down to um, 1902, which was the, the first syllabus. And in that sense, it didn't have that chronological, this happens, this happens, this happens. It was going backwards in time and it was just pulling out these these discourses and one of the things that i found over across the entire 114 years which came out in my conclusion in the end was that you know health was always a part of pe it's just that it was voiced and manifested in different ways um and it started out as you know helping the poor little working class kids get healthier and it ended up where we are now it is this notion of personal responsibility and self-regulation for health. In other words, we're teaching children to, from the age of five that they need to exercise because it's good for them. In a nutshell, this is what you need to do. And so, so that's sort of, you know, uh, that's five years work i've just explained in five minutes <laughs> fantastic what a bargain uh, for anyone listening and is not even charging <laughs> for it that's wonderful and god so much there well, maybe we need to jump on another call because you know the the um uh, the continuity and discontinuity in that narrative yes. and you know you, you you to start at the present the as you say the the ideological purposes of health have now gone to personal responsibility and agency supposedly mm. whereas yeah. 120 years ago you know i guess you know there's there's peer historians who would talk about why why were people the, the late victorians and early turn of the century people why were they so bothered about the kids in the slums being a bit healthier yeah. and it's probably yeah. for military reasons that they could um, hold their yeah. own in, um, you know, after the Boer War, etc. So yeah, big influence uh, the military. Yeah, and also, and I would add in um, just just to say also because they want healthy little factory workers too. Exactly. Yeah. No, absolutely. And while at the same time, you know, the ignoring the structural issues, the causes of poor health, and yet yeah. today there's so much talk about. Um, you know, personal responsibility, choices, something, you know, we could really problematize, make healthy lifestyle choices, while at the same time, you know, David Kirk's new book around precarity, you've got kids growing up in the most unstable environments, exactly. uh, high stress levels in the home, and sadly, as we all know, food banks, cost of living crisis, so yeah. those same things still seem to be lingering around and that would mm. we, we mm. maybe another time and and you know why why should why should PE practitioners be aware of that I think we could really dive into to, to that and you know without sounding burdensome because you know it, there's so much to get your head around teaching is a complex and difficult job mm. so you know to throw in critical social theory especially from someone who's not got that on their first degree or doesn't feel particularly comfortable in that area typically you know mm -hmm. someone who's come from a sports science or 
fitness perspective, that really is very challenging, isn't it? To, to then understand a whole different discipline. Um, so yeah, let's save that. I'm really wary of the time. So Rachel, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and listening to you. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>